Welcome to In Focus, where we delve into the life and career of activist, entrepreneur and politician Jenny Wise Power. This project began life as a panel discussion for the 2020 festival, but like so many things in this past year, it was postponed and moved online. So, in true lockdown style, I sat down for a Zoom chat with three of Ireland's leading feminist historians to discuss this fascinating life story. Dr Margaret Ward is Honorary Senior Lecturer in History at Queen's University, Belfast. Dr Mary McAuliffe, Assistant Professor and Lecturer in Gender Studies at UCD. And Dr Sinead McCool, author and curator at the Jackie Clark Collection in Mayo. All three women have written extensively about this period and have been involved in many of the events of the Decade of Centenaries. was born Jenny O'Toole to uh, Edward O'Toole and her mother was Mary Norton and she was one of seven children. She was the youngest in the family and it seems that the family were uh, came from a farming background. Um, I'm not sure how large a, a, a farm, I don't think so. Her father also had a, developed a leather and a provisions business in Balting class. So, um, you know, it's not long after the famine. So, there's all that residue, that feeling her parents would have lived through that famine period as well. So that's, it's only 10 years later. So that's something that would have been very much within the family memory um, and obviously would have affected the family all around there. But they don't stay in, in rural Ireland for very long. When, when she's two, the family moved to, to Dublin and uh, the father sets up business there. So she comes very much from, a, I guess, a sort of small shopkeeping sort of background at that time. And she comes from a very political family as well. Her, her, the O'Toole seem to have been strong supporters of the Fenians. And uh, her, um, her daughter, Nancy, later talks about um, one of her, Jenny's brothers, having joined the Fenians on his way from school, leaving school to do it, to join the Fenian Rising in 1867. And it was in the middle of winter, it was snow, and he got pneumonia and, and died. Um, so I think that that was something that I, I feel influenced Jenny in many different ways growing up. And then all we really know about her is, you know, that she was educated, but by the time she was 20, both of her parents had died. And we don't then know how did she support herself? Um, did her older siblings help her? Um, was the family business still there? I'm not sure of the answer to any of those questions. How she then pops up is at the age of 23, a few years later, when the Ladies' Land League is formed and she's in Dublin and their offices are, are in Dublin and she goes, as she says um, later on about herself, very nervously because she didn't have any letter of introduction to the uh, Ladies' Land League office and she meets Anna Parnell for the first time who you know, put her at her rest and from then on she becomes a very active member of the Ladies' Land League and that's the start of her public career. She does seem to have kept, uh, or the family kept in contact with the O'Toole's in, in West Wicklow, because of course, when Jenny joins the Ladies' Land League, she becomes an organiser down there in that part of the world and uh, helps coordinate uh, several meetings and chairs meetings of the Ladies' Land League and sets up a uh, one of the branches, branches. In, in West Wicklow. Um, so there's very much that, uh, even though they've 
become an urban family, I suppose, by the 1860s. Um, they very much keep in touch with their um, rural background in West Wicklow and very much, I would say, be aware of the inequities of uh, eviction and rent rents um, and the policies of the Land League. And of course, Jenny is a supporter of both Anna Parnell and Charles, her brother. Um, it's interesting to say Anna Parnell first and refer to her brother uh, as a, a, in relation to her um, for the rest of their lives. Um, and so you see from a very, very early age, she is so political and so involved. And that must have been in the family there. You know, we don't know the Fenian connection, um, but maybe through her education, there is so much more we need to know about Jenny Wise power and what informed her politics. But like so many of these women, these political women, a lot of their particularly earlier lives are lost because records aren't kept. Um, and all, it was expected they would just marry and become mothers and housewives rather than somebody like Jenny Wise Power, an extraordinarily political and active woman, woman all of her life. She had very much an independent presence of spirit so that she, you know, um, in her involvement in the Ladies' Land League, she's in her early 20s. She has a confidence sort of way beyond her years. And when she goes to um, be at an eviction um, and, and attend there, the, the story that she tells herself of that time is that she's actually um, in dialogue with the, um, the, the RIC. So she's, she's not somebody who's just there as a bystander or just in the, in the crowd or representing the Ladies' Land League. Land League. She's, she's actually, you know, crossing the fields and she talks about that in, you know, in the clothes that she's wearing, but also that she is, she's, she's engaging with the police. So we see her not na ma merely as a sort of a, one of the members. And I think what's, what's interesting is when you think about the likes of, um, you know, um, you know, Catherine Tynan, when she talks about the, the great majority of these women in the Ladies' Land League were, were harmless women and girls. Well, she's not one of them. She's already a leader, even though she's in her early 20s. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, because she becomes an executive member very early on. So I think that someone like Anna Parnell sees the potential that she's got there. She seems particularly fearless. I mean, when at Hackettstown, they need reinforcements and uh, uh, one of the young Cantrells comes along. She's only 14. You know, there's not a lot of women. I mean, Anna Parnell talks about the fact that uh, it was very difficult to get families to release their daughters for that kind of work of actually confronting process servers during evictions, etc. And I think one of the things about Jenny is the fact that she's an orphan. She doesn't have parents to say, you know, you can't do that. So she she is freer, in a sense, to be her true self and to do what she wants. And she's also the librarian um, for the Ladies' Land League, you know, giving out... Uh, books to to all the prisoners that that in itself is quite a job when there's thousands of prisoners you know to to be catering for in that mm -hmm. sense the reason that we know of her as a librarian with the ladies land league is the survival of the documents that the letters that came from from the um, the men who were imprisoned back to her and i think that in slightly that's a misread of her at this particular point yes she was a librarian but we know from nancy that she was also um involved already with john um wise Power and she was taking secret messages for him. So at the end of the day, the idea of her getting into the prison with the books is a way of sending sort of secret messages in and out. And I think what, what when we have to look at these women and we have to, to sort of re-examine re the sources, and we have been doing that in recent years in terms of it, is that it's not always, um, we can't always as, as historians maybe get the documentation to actually prove something. We, you know, there, there's quite a lot of material just to suggest that she's central an organization. Another thing that she did was, um, and, and um, Sinead or Mary could probably say more about it, but that she got things like jurors lists so that when people were being tried for activities, um, they, they, they were obviously trying to put pressure on jurors not to convict. So she was doing, doing some pretty dangerous uh, work as, uh, as well. You know, I mean, she seems to have been completely involved in, in all aspects of the resistance to landlordism in Ireland. I mean, these women and young women, girls, some of them, were being condemned uh, by society, but also by the church. Like the, the Archbishop McCabe was very critical of the women and, and, and uh, as was Dermot Croke, uh, the Archbishop of Cashel, um, which is kind of ironic because her husband 
future husband, John Weisbauer, was very much instrumental in setting up the GAA um, and involved in that. Uh, and some and the women are being harassed by the authorities as well. And there are some stories, you know, of um, women Ladies Land League members being at evictions and standing at the front because they didn't think that the RIC would attack them. Um, but of course, they were attacked, some of them, and some of them were physically roughed up. Um, so it, it's it's not an easy life they are living. And I think this is a, a fairly tough training ground for women like Jenny. Uh, but she works her way through it. And as Sinead said, she is, she is instrumental in not just being at evictions, but also being active having agency at these at these evictions and and taking secret messages in and out of the prisons um and again it's that forgetting of women's vital and central role within um really radical uh, politics that's going on at this time for young women who are not supposed to have any political or public uh, activity well just going back to jenny wise power herself is that i think when, when we talk about not having a sort of an understanding of somewhere where someone's educated or where somebody has has their has their their information um, in terms of their wider wider family. I suppose we know we do we do know as, as sort of talked about earlier on that there's a, a wider family and a wider community with cousins that are active and, and involved. And certainly when she becomes um more involved, let's say um moving on in time with her involvement with the with Parnell and, and that, it's 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 sort of like there's the family circle. There's the there's the political circle and this intermixing with people where they 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 cluster together and they begin to work together. So I suppose the fact that she um you know she she marries a man who's who's already an activist, who's a journalist, who's who's who seems to be they move constantly and that's sort of typical of of, of this period in time. But they they move for work, they move for for um to, to be at the, but they keep coming back themselves. To live in the center of Dublin, so they're at the center of things. And then, of course, you know, they're, they're, you know, when when she's having her her small children, while on one level people would say she's she's not being active, but she produces this, and um, you know, she produces a book on um, um Parnell speeches after after his death, because of course they're Parnell supporters, and 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 she's really um very close to him. But there's a wonderful story again that sort of gives you a glimpse of who she is. You know, Parnell um, has now, you know, the war scandals happened and um, he's losing his power. He's losing all his supporters, but herself and John say central to, to the group of people that surround him. And she says to him, if you had given the vote to women and, um, you know, you might have won and, um, uh, you know, the by-elections. And she, she stands up to a man who who doesn't have a, a reputation in terms of our reading of him to sort of maybe have had and um, seen the value of women, but she sees, so she's talking to him at this early stage as an equal. Oh yeah. And I, I think also that we have to take into account that, um, you know, women generally are not written into the history books in that central way. I mean, you see Jenny Wise Power as, as, um, on the executive committee of so many important organizations, both women run and women organized ones, but also things like Sinn Féin, uh, then a member of Dublin Corporation, then in the first Irish Free State Senate um, for the, the duration of its existence, 2236. Um, a very important woman. And if you look at the contemporary newspapers of the day, all, oftentimes her speeches are being reported in the newspapers. Um, so in many ways, it's not that she wasn't known of at the time as an important woman, as an activist, as somebody who was central to, to many, particularly once the Irish Free State is set up, um, who isn't going up against the legislation, particularly the anti-women legislation of the Irish Free State. Whereas Jenny is a wife and a mother and a public activist. Um, and she is not incredibly different to an awful lot of the hardworking uh, politically motivated, ideologically motivated women who were putting in uh, that work to many of the organizations for, you know, cultural nationalism, then the, the, the republicanism, then women's rights, women's workers' rights. Um, and that often is missing from the mainstream narratives of Irish history, particularly 20th century Irish history that we're talking about. Um, and I think it has to do with, with gender. And, and I think it's something we can't actually um, not take account for.
So she has the Henry Street restaurant. She sets up the Irish Farm Produce Company. She gets um, Irish, local Irish produce, a lot of it from her relatives mm. in Carlow and Wicklow. But she feeds, for example, the suffragettes where, th when they're in jail. And then she uses her premises for um, the volunteers to meet. And later on in 1990, 1920, Nancy says for six months during the War of Independence, the IRA executive had their headquarters. Mm -hmm. there. When you think we don't, they didn't have uh, the communications that we have. So you know that if you want to see Arthur Griffith or John McBride or something, you go to Henry Street at lunchtime. And Nancy says she met everybody there because of who came at the O'Rahilly came practically every day. Sean McDermott was there a lot. So she knew everybody. Um, mm. They all came and they knew that this was the linchpin, really. This is where they could see each other and it wouldn't look suspicious. When you look at that, and, and Margaret has drawn it really, really well in terms of the central point, the idea that that sensitive material was, was being discussed there that she was a safe pair of hands for transferring of this information. It's exactly the same sort of network and, and um, you know, passage of information that, that's so key and crucial. And I, I remember um, I, I I, when I was doing my original studies, I, I looked at the sort of the whole concept salon politics and it's sort of that unwritten record and the idea of the transfer of information. And so even today we sort of see with people, the people who are sort of most significant, who literally um, are that sort of the, the person that you, you can only place them someplace if you don't know what happened or what was said or what happened. But I just want, I wanted to sort of read a quote, if that was all right, for, for um, just to, to sort of contextualize something that's been said previously. And that is that, that she really saw in terms of her Irishness, the idea of the, that, that she was part of a long tradition of activists. And she, she lectured on that. But she said of the Daily League that this was a novel cultural body that rejected the false sex and class distinctions, which were the result of English influence. And she writes this in The Political Influence of Women in Modern Ireland, which was in The Voice of Ireland. And it's published uh, in, in the 1920s. And what's really important in terms of the, her commentary in relation to the to her overviewing of these organizations is that she is very conscious a lot of the time of, of being a sort of an equal participant and she sought out those places. And when she's, she is the businesswoman, and I mean, there's not only one shop, but there's a you know, series of shops and one of which is, is run by her in-laws. So it's again, the family network to, as, as, as Margaret said, the produce is coming from other relatives and it's a way of, of giving employment to people as well as, as, as having something that is of Ireland. Her idea of you know Irish industry, wearing Irish clothing, all of that is so part, so much part of the ethos and thinking. And that's all part as well, of course, of Inian and Aheron and uh, her involvement in that and the idea of the, the Buy Irish campaigns and, um, you know, the campaign against the uh, taking the, the, the children on the patriotic children's mm -hmm. treat during the visit of Queen Victoria or as, as a kind of a protest to that. Um, and uh, that that's, you know, I think it's a developing sense of a you know, what would become a post-colonial identity? Who, what did it mean to be Irish? What did it mean? Um, so it's, it's her involvement in cultural nationalism um, and her, uh, you know, helping to set up the Irish College in Ring, um, her involvement in, in all those aspects of this kind of developing concept of Irishness. Uh, which of course then feeds into militant nationalism, nationalism as well. And her involvement in Sinn Féin and Arthur Griffith also reflects that. Um, so she's a woman obviously who is, who's, you can see the development of her political ideologies, but also her identities. Uh, it, similarly to many other of the men and women of this, these times, I mean, uh, she's part of, although she's older than, she's also would would have been in that milieu of, of those young men and women that, that Roy Foster so vividly describes in Vivid Faces, um, who were, uh, you know, in these restaurants and coffee shops discussing militant nationalism, a cultural nationalism, a Gaelic renaissance, senses of, of what it meant to be Irish, uh, women's involvement in 
suffrage campaigns and then in republicanism. Um, like as, as Markovic said, the, the Jenny is certainly somebody who is fighting for the, the three great causes, the cause of Ireland, the cause of women and the cause of women workers. And, and you'll see that throughout her career from the Ladies' Land League to her participation in the campaign against the 1937 Women in the Home Articles of the Constitution. There's, there's a thread that runs through her political life that is very much centred on Ireland, Irishness and women. As a mother, what's really great is that she has two daughters. Her first daughter, Catherine, dies in infancy, but uh, Maura becomes um, a really well-known Gaelic scholar. But her daughters are, are taught Irish by some of the Anini women who are teaching the children Irish. So there's a lovely kind of continuity there. And Nancy, her daughter, becomes a, a Kamenaman organiser. So she's completely, the whole family network is completely uh, involved and, and working together for a free Gaelic Ireland. Jenny had been involved in the Dublin Women's Suffrage Association, which is the earliest uh, organisation set up by Thomas and Anna Haslam, which later uh, transmogrifies, has different names, and becomes the Irish Women's Suffrage and Local Government Association. And we know she's really she's got a really strong civic sense always. So when she she becomes a poor law guardian very early on um, for the North Dublin Union, and she. You know, she's just it's like a side of this. But what's interesting is that the nuns run the union and Lady Aberdeen, the Viceroy's wife, is coming to visit and the Sinn Féin members prevent that. You know, Lady Aberdeen was not the worst of the uh, uh, colonial rulers. She was very much a feminist and, and, and a supporter of suffrage herself. Nevertheless, she represented British rule over Ireland and, and Jenny was quite clear that that wasn't going to happen but she was a suffragist and um, later on when 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 suffragettes were being imprisoned and losing and Hannah she Skeffington gets uh, dismissed from work she's very much there uh, at the forefront of the committee that's formed to support Hannah uh, they, they make a collection uh, they present her with a silver tea service, for example, and it's Jenny who does the presentation. So she's seen as, I think, the woman with the continuity. She mm -hmm. is the feminist who started at the Ladies' Land League, went through Anini, and she has that seniority, I okay. think, amongst Irish feminist women, and, and she's given that credit, and obviously her support for suffrage prisoners by sending in food every day for yeah. the restaurant. And within Sinn Féin, remember, she's still, she's vice president of Sinn Féin. She's fighting with Griffith. I mean, she's trying to support women, even though uh, Sinn Féin don't, uh, Griffith certainly doesn't support the militant movement. So although she wouldn't be a militant herself, she's right there and she's writing and she's supporting them. Uh, and she, she says there's a great uh, quotation from her, do not think that government of half the population by the other half is self-government. It's news to me that women of Ireland form no part of the Irish population. And that said in 1912, she was a strong, strong woman. And what I particularly like and appreciate now as I'm older is the fact that she has a domestic role, she has her children, she has, and she subverts all of that. It's that continuity of the of the, the, the greater good for Irish people in general, that idea of pu full public service that she had, that when she's serving people, she's doing to the best of her ability. Mm -hmm. And when she was a poor, poor law guardian, like so many people, not, not only women, there was an agent that was put in place to try and, and, and you know, blacken her name. Um, and that may be one of the reasons that she wasn't elected on a, on a third occasion, because a lot of this rumor, because of, sometimes she had taken a stand 
against um, you know, people in institutions or whether she thought it wasn't the right thing to do. So she was very much about what she felt was right and sticking to the, 